Welcome everybody to the Methodist Church's webinar series. This webinar today is about emergency response planning and buying and selling church property. Uh, we're recording this webinar and the relevant information will be made available on our website afterwards. With questions and answers, if you post them as you think of them, we'll, we'll answer questions at the end of each speaker. Thanks to being locked down in our, in our homes at the moment, uh, we may not be as efficient as usual with everything, but we'll give it our best bash. Um, today, we've got Wendy Anderson with us, and I'm, I'm Trudy, by the way, and Wendy has been the property and insurance manager for the Methodist Church for over five years, and in that time, she's been involved in property investments, both in New Zealand and overseas. Uh, she's also the go-to person when it comes to buying and selling property. Um, with, with regards to our process at the moment, I'm going to let Wendy speak first because I know I can make the technology work that way. So Wendy, just let me know when you want the, the screen shared and your PowerPoint's up. Thank you, Trudy. Um, <coughs> yes, Trudy's introduced me. I'll introduce Trudy. So Trudy Downs is our health and safety coordinator. She calls herself the caretaker. So she's the church Methodist Church in New Zealand caretaker. Uh, Trudy's been with us for around three and a half years, I think it is, Trudy, and prior to that, she's she's come from a, a health and safety uh, background in construction and has worked in construction and also co-managed a, um, a decorating business with her husband. Thank you. As Trudy said, I, I want to talk to you about buying and selling property because it's probably one of the questions I get asked the most. So I thought uh, we, can, we can start the, the presentation. <laughs> um, I thought, I thought it would be a good idea to cover buying and selling property. It, uh, buying and selling is, is reasonably similar, um, but with the exception that um, the funds are held in CBNL when you, when you sell. So for, first of all, I'll start with selling property. I can't see that, Trudy. Oh, dear. That, maybe if I go share screen. There it is. So first of all, I, as I said, I'll talk a bit, uh, speak about selling property. Um, and, and the question, the question I usually ask, is why do, you, why do you want to sell the property? So what's the reason for selling the property? Is it, is it because it's a redundant property? Is it because you want to, uh, the, the, perhaps the maintenance is, has um, been deferred and that you wish to uh, sell the property and replace it? Or sometimes it's, it's an extra property or a, a parish is, is no longer want, wanting that property. So, the, the MCPs say when they approve the property sales, will ask, why do you want to sell the property? And if it's a church, quite often um, they will scrutinise that reasonably closely because once a church is it leaves or is sold from a, uh, an, a region or an area, it's very, very difficult to get a new church uh, <laughs> down the track to in, a, in an area that may have expanded or you may have uh, the population growth has, has, has gone into that region. So selling a property is quite a, a reasonably serious business uh, for the church when it is actually a church, a, a church building. We probably deal mostly uh, with the sale of residential property. And if we could scroll down one more, Trudy. And, and the question is, but the question, why are you selling the property, is actually because redundant properties, if they're not being replaced, 15% of the net proceeds will go into the development fund and the remaining 85% will be paid into the, the parish's CBNL account. Next one. So one of, one of the things that MCPC will also look at and um, the parish should look at as well in the Synod is that what is this parish strategy or their vision? Why, why have they decided to sell this property? Um, and 
uh, where do they see the parish and, and um, the church or the churches that the parish is responsible for in the future? So it's the long-term plan for the parish. How are you going to, uh, you know, it's regarding growth of the parish, um, attracting new members, outreach, mission, all of those questions. Yes, next one. So the, first th the, the first thing that we advise you to do, although you're always welcome to call me, um, is to consult with the Synod Property Advisory Committee. They are there to assist you with the sale and purchase of property and, and construction projects. And they have a, a committee that's been appointed to assist parishes with property matters. So the Senate Property Advisory Committee will, will assist you in, in <clears throat> how to go about selling that property. Once you have your the, the parish's approval or um, agreement to sell the property, the first thing that you would need to do, and if you could scroll down, Trudy, that would be great, is to um, obtain a registered valuer's market valuation. And the reason for that is that is the bottom line uh, for MCPC's approval. That's what the property is worth in the market, and that's based on properties in the vicinity and the current market. So that would determine what you would expect to be offered for the property. The registered valuers market valuation uh, needs to be included with an application through to MCPC for approval to sell the property. But that's, that's your benchmark on what you would expect to, to receive for that property. Sometimes it doesn't always work out, but um, that may be that the market has changed in that area or and that, that properties have are not selling. Sometimes it is, or, or the type of property that you're trying to sell is not actually a desirable property for the, the market at the moment. One of the, uh, there are a number of things that you need to consider when selling a property. And um, one of the things is, we, uh, is the possession date. And I had an interesting question today um, from a parish that has been given approval to sell their property. And they, were, uh, they, were, they had asked me, would it be possible if we find a property now or if we decide to build a property, would it be possible for us to have bridging finance? to purchase the property until our property sells. And I, I've also recommended that they also consider the possession date. So the possession date could be pushed out uh, to give the parish time to purchase the property. Uh, properties in Auckland, as most people from that area will know, are not on the market very long and they are expensive. And um, finding, finding a suitable property is not a, an easy task. The other thing to consider is actually building costs. And the fact is that um, in today's <coughs> environment with COVID-19, building supplies are um, not always easy to obtain. And also the cost, the cost of building um, is more expensive because of, of the building materials not being easily sourced. One thing that is, absolutely necessary is if the board is not a model D trust, sorry, if the property is not a model D trust property, that uh, a member of the board of administration needs to sign the sale and purchase agreement. And that is of course, after the um, approval from MCPC. We could go over an application to MCPC. I have already covered that in earlier webinars. So you're welcome to, to um, look online to see previous webinars regarding the process for MCPC. But as I have said, the Senate is there to help you and so am I. So I'm only, I welcome your phone calls regarding the sale of property. Next one, Trudy, I think it's buying property. So I'll cover buying property now, um, and the 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 process before you you buy a property is is the same as selling, and that you need those approvals from your parish, um, from the synod, and also from MCPC. 
and you'll have an idea of how much you want to spend. There are, are a number of methods to, to sell property. So if you're purchasing a property at auction, it is actually quite a difficult task to have MCPC approval prior to auction. In fact, unless the auction is um, a few weeks out or a number of, or even a, a months out, um, MCPC would not be in a position to be able to approve that purchase. However, if it is an auction, um, you could purchase the property subject to the Board of Administration approval. Generally, what would happen is that the market valuation uh, will determine what you, what MCPC would approve uh, <coughs> funding from your CBN account for, or um, uh, or the purchase of the, the property purchase price. Deadline sales are a lot easier to handle in the, in the fact that you can um, wait to, to, the, to the deadline and then submit your offer and you will have time to do, well, hopefully you would have time to do your due diligence and um, that would be to obtain a market valuation and a builder's report. Tenders are similar to deadline sales, but in actual fact, um, you get one chance at a tender. Deadline sales are similar, but with a tender, you get one chance and um, the real estate agent would always say, put in your best offer. With a private sale, that is a, a, you've, a purchase has, has approached you to purchase a property and um, a private sale and purchase agreement would be drawn up by their solicitor presented the offer presented to you and that offer would be scrutinized by the church lawyer. Um, and, and one of the things that the church lawyer will want is um, to, to, to look at the title, are there any, uh, um, is there anything on the title that needs to be, that any questions regarding that or it needs to be sorted or, um, is, is finance approved? Is the market valuation approved? And also, also the builder's report will also have a bearing on um, confirming on a property. Thanks, Trudy. So approval to purchase a property needs to, to come from uh, the, the parish synod and MCPC. It's based, and as I said, it's based on the market valuation as to what you would expect to pay or to be able to pay. Uh, sometimes there are a number of offers and uh, the, the parish may wish to, to purchase a property. So they may go back to MCPC and ask if they could offer more than the market valuation. And if that is justified, if there's a good reason, MCPC will definitely consider that and have approved those in the past. In that instance, because generally there's 10 days due diligence, 10 working days, we, I would ask MCPC to approve that by email and they would turn that around in 48 hours. They can turn around email approvals as well for auctions uh, in 48 hours, but uh, it's, not, it's not a given that they'll always be able to see their emails all of the time. A builder's report, as I said before, will also determine <coughs> whether the pro property is suitable. And um, one of the things that we we are, or, or the MCPC are looking at now, is, or the church is looking at, is um, rising sea levels in properties near the water. Trudy, I think that might be it. No, <laughs> it's not. I think this is the last one. So once again, consider the possession date. You may want to push that out because you want to do due diligence. Um, you may also have sold a property and you're waiting for, for, for the settlement of that property. And you, you also you may be considering your funding, where that funding is going to come from. And once again, a member of the Board of Administration is to sign the sale and purchase agreement. So that sums up what I wanted to speak about, uh, talk to you about to, tonight. Um, the sale of property, it, it, it is a church property and therefore the board Generally, if it's uh, in the in the top title or the title is held by the board of administration, we would 
require or, or the a board member must sign that document and all of the, uh, the other legal documents for the conveyancing of that property. So thank you. I will introduce you to Trudy. Good everybody. My topic for tonight is um, creating an emergency response plan. Um, if we go to the website, so I'll put us back onto screen sharing again. Hit the share button this time. Um, oh, I missed my computer at work. Just a moment, please, people, while I get my act together. On the website, the emergency response plan is on, uh, it's set up in steps. So there's three steps. Today, we're going to be talking about step one, which is just creating the emergency response plan. Next month's webinar will be around getting the approval from Fire and Emergency New Zealand about the evacuation plan. The evacuation plan is part of the emergency response plan. Um, the first step in this, the, the, the way that this plan has been put together is start at the top and just work your way through step by step. There's almost no point in trying to jump a step because it, it just won't work that way. So if you start with the guideline, which I guess will take us to a document I don't have open yet. This guideline here, there's the three steps involved. So create your emergency response plan, uh, who gets involved with what during an emergency. In, that, in creating the emergency response plan, we gather different pieces of information to put the plan together, um, building warrant of fitness, property titles, uh, things like that. But if we go to the templates and instructions, the first document here is about creating an emergency response team. So this is the people that will be involved in undertaking the response if an emergency occurs. And there's a little bit of maths behind this. I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Um, you might have fire wardens, you might have traffic controllers, first aid people, you might even delegate somebody to say you're the person who's going to phone 111 if there's an emergency, um, just to coordinate people on site as an emergency happens. Uh, you need to know the risk of the activities in your buildings. For example, if you were a fireworks factory, your risk is going to be that much higher than if you're running church services and only church services once a day on Sundays. Um, obviously, the risk is different between the two uses. So you may have exactly the same floor plan. You may have exactly the same number of people. But because the activity is different, then you need to apply a different risk factor to your uh, emergency response. And that's why this particular table is written up the way that it is. You need to take into consideration how risky are our activities, how many people do we have on site, and how big is our site. Ideally, a building warden, for example, should be able to walk through their space that they're checking off and still be able to meet in the assembly area within two to three minutes. So everybody should be able to get out of the building in two to three minutes. Um, first aider, the number of people that need to be trained and available in first aid, again, dependent on how big a risk your activity is and how many people. And there's all, all numbers in there. Um, now, those numbers in that table are baseline. Some of the other factors you need to take into consideration are the types of people that are inside the building as well. Uh, elderly people, children, pregnant women, people with disabilities, 
who might need assistance to leave the building. Um, one of the parishes in Christchurch also took into account they didn't have enough footpath space to empty people out onto, so they chose to assemble across the road, which meant that they needed traffic controllers. They also had people within the parish who used wheelchairs, and for them to get across the road, they needed to go up a gutter, over a gutter. So they also got a ramp just for the gutter, so that in the event of emergency, somebody's grabbed the ramp, the traffic controllers make sure there's no oncoming traffic or stop the traffic, the ramp goes down and people in wheelchairs are able to assemble with everybody else. So it was a great team effort to actually walk through the entire building and go, what do we need at this point in time of, this, of the entire site to make sure that we get everybody to where they need to get to in time? Uh, some of the other things we need to consider are is if there's shift work. Now, in church, it's not so much shift work as we're not paid to be there, we want to be there, but we're not always there. So therefore, some of the wardens might actually be your greeters. The people at the door who greet people coming in may be the emergency building wardens for the day, in which case you're actually going to have a, a, a changing, perhaps an ever-changing team of people who are being the wardens in your buildings. Um, so we need to allow for shifts or rosters, holiday and, and sickness cover. And from that, in this document, it will help you to build an emergency response team. And then if we go to the instructions, We've got our people together. Now, I always say that um, health and safety is, is a team sport. It's not individual. If it was an individual game, I could create every single one of you your own emergency response plan. But I can't because I don't know your buildings. I don't know your people. And I, I don't know the layout of where your assembly point might be. Therefore, it's a whole lot easier to go through the creation of the plan with a team of people. And once you've got that team of people together, if you go to the process on the website and move into um, step one of creating emergency response plan, once we've got our team together, then we jump into our template instructions and work our way through these. Now these are are uh, designed to be guidelines are used in line with templates. The templates are what you just fill in. Um, and then from that, you will be able to create, excuse me just a moment, a document like this one here. So for each possible event that you might have in your building, you will have a response plan for that event. Um, these are all standard events. Some of them that you might want to consider what are the chances of us actually having a bomb threat? What are the chances of us actually having a suspicious object left in our buildings? You may or may not want to include that because you go, actually, we're in the middle of nowhere and that risk is so small, we don't think it's viable you don't need to create a response plan for that risk. Everything else though, power failure, absolutely. Everybody's likely to have a power failure. Earthquakes, yes, we're all gonna have earthquakes. Disrupt, disruptive visitors, uh, most likely. And for each one of those, you need to pull together a plan and it's best if you then practice that plan. Even if all the practice is, is the team walks through what should happen for the plan and works out actually that's that's a silly plan, that, that doesn't make sense, and then you modify the plan. So this is an ongoing uh, test the plan to see if it works, modify it if it doesn't work. The templates have been created in 
uh, two formats. One is a flip chart format like this. It requires a little bit of Microsoft Word knowledge to be able to create it. If you've got any difficulties with that, then you can contact me and I'll give you assistance with that. You need to know the information that I need to put into the form, but I'll pull the form together and send that through to you. There is another format um, which is a whole lot easier to put together and you can create tabs, uh, just buy a set of the tabs from the stationery shop and split it up that way to make sure that you can find the specific incidents when you need it. Excuse me. Um, sorry about that. Oh, that knocked me off my balance. Um, so these instructions, again, will take you through these steps here. We started out and we created our emergency response team. We got our template and we filled it in using the instructions. And then there's more templates on there that will help you fill out the remainder of the requirements you need to label up your building to help people know uh, what are the steps we should take in the event of fire? Where is the assembly point that we need to go to? Um, the other thing we need to consider is if we are the building stewards, whether we reside in the building or not, uh, for example, you might have a commercial uh, tenancy. You're not in there, but they've got 10, 15 people in there. We're responsible for creating the evacuation plan. Um, so we need to be able to provide an evacuation plan to our tenants so they can create their emergency response plan. We're also the ones that are responsible for uh, the fire drills in that building. Even though we are not there, if we're the building stewards, we are responsible for the evacuation plan. And that information all comes out of the stage here of creating our emergency response plan for the building. If we are co-tenanting with other people in our buildings, we need their feedback as well that the emergency plan works for them. Uh, so at Langdon's Road in Christchurch, we have two tenants upstairs and every six months I'll call our meeting with their building wardens and we'll walk through the program of how we're going to get everybody out of the building safely. That way, if the tenancy has a change in staff and they have a new building warden, or they want to train up another backup person for holiday leave or sick leave, they also have the opportunity to walk through with the entire group. So all of our building wardens know who the other building wardens are and the other tenancies and they can work together as a team. Once we have that feedback from the um, other tenants, then we, we do our walkthroughs with the emergency response team and we can work out if there's any more amendments that are needed to the process or the documents. And from there, once we've got all of our processes worked out, we put all of our labels up in our building and make copies of the emergency response plan available through the building as well. So I'm not sure if I've got any more pictures of what that entails, but they will be available on the website. So we've got flip chart. Now I've made some templates, one's obviously for an office, which means that there are regular people manning the front desk, so to speak, so they'll be able to have a more fixed role with an emergency response. Um, the other flip chart version is for a parish or a rohi, and they're less likely to have uh, continuous staffing levels, or the, or the people might change, and therefore the template is, is more flexible to allow for different people being involved in the process. And then, as I said, there is um, this side. Instead of having a flip chart, there's allowance to have tabs down the side of the document. Now, the last document that's uh, in the set 
is around the um, escape, hide and tell is about sheltering in place. This particular document was created after the mosque shootings in Christchurch. What happened in the Connectional Office is uh, the high school, which is two doors down from the Connectional Office, was the high school that was placed under lockdown and the police put a cordon out on the street. Um, and all of the staff in the office went to the windows to look out going, oh, look, there's a cordon out on the street. And what we should have been doing was undertaking our own lockdown process. But because we'd not gone through the process ourselves, uh, we didn't really think about it. It wasn't until afterwards where you start thinking about the ramifications and all the risk that was involved. We should have been doing something and we should have had a plan. So one of the things with an escape, hide and tell plan is it shouldn't go online. It shouldn't be publicly available. Because if you are dealing with a terrorist or somebody who is intent on doing harm, uh, providing them with your response plan means that they then have the information of how they go about doing what they want to do much more effectively than, than if they didn't have your plan. So I'm not quite sure how to get this template across to people and still provide the information. Um, that particular template uh, may be subject to change. And the other templates we have on here is an evacuation wall chart. That is a fire and no, I, I apologize. The evacuation wall chart is based on a site plan. So where your building is and where you might go to assemble. Again, that's why I can't create plans for every parish because I don't have that information. It needs to come from within the parish. The next template is the fire action notice. This is uh, specifically to fire and emergency New Zealand's requirements, including the background color blue is a specific blue. Um, and the last template is for bomb threats. When, if somebody was to phone through a bomb threat, there's certain things that we need to be paying attention to. Uh, the voice on the other end of the line, was it a male, was it a female, high voice, low voice? Did it sound like a child playing a prank? Um, did they have an accent? Um, is there noises in the background? All of these sorts of things. So there's a checklist, which ideally should be kept by the main phone, so that should somebody ring up in a threatening um, danger or harm, you don't need to think about it. You can just pull your list out and, and start making notes and paying attention to what they're saying. Um, if that situation occurs where somebody phones up to make a threat, hopefully there's somebody in the background you can grab their attention and get them to come and help you out as well so that you don't have to deal with a, a bomb threat by yourself. And that is the information for the first stage. Now, um, I may have gone through it just a little bit quickly, but the, the point is that it is a process. Uh, a team event, every aspect needs to be uh, practiced within the team. Uh, you may start with just the emergency response team, and then you might bring in other building users, such as when you run your fire drill and, and you clear out the congregation on a Sunday morning with your fire drill. There's uh, other things that you need to be aware of. Uh, the inbuilt sirens. So uh, at the connectional office, our alarm box, our fire box is not connected through to the fire station, which means I can just rock up to the evacuation keyhole, put the key in, turn it, and set the fire alarm off. But it's not going to call in the fire station uh, with them thinking that it's a fire. But across the road at Christchurch North, I did it there as well, their box is connected to the fire station, and I didn't think about it. So uh, I had to make a couple of phone calls after I set it off, just to make sure the fire engine did not turn up and then to get the person in to come and reset the alarm box. So if you do have 
um, an alarm box that the, the fire um, and emergency people would come and look at if the building was on fire. That's where you trigger the evacuation response, but you need to understand how your system works. Otherwise you'll do what I did and, and you'll potentially call in the fire engine when it's not needed. But um, we've run a number of evacuation drills. That will be a third webinar that I'll discuss those sorts of things because I've had various parishes call through and say, even though we had our emergency response plan, things did not go to plan. And the emergency that we had uh, was a bit of a shambles. And that's why the last step of the process is about having drills and practicing our response plans, because that's where you're really going to find whether things work or not, or how well they work and what needs changing. So I'll leave it there. If you've got any questions on this, uh, please do let me know. You could either email through, phone through, or just sit back and think about it, form your team together and then and see how that works out. Wendy, we, we have no questions tonight. I saw that, which is good. We must have covered it. <laughs> um, I guess just a reminder to everybody that the, this webinar will be available on the website, uh, most likely tomorrow, Trudy. Yes, Not tonight. Not um, tonight. Not tonight. If you had any, if you wanted to send any feedback, please feel free to send it back to Trudy and myself. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. That's right. So the next webinar is the 12th of October. Uh, as I said, I'll be talking about approved evacuation plans, which is the next stage after creating your emergency response plan. And Wendy will be discussing property security. Um, ideally, property security would be closer to Christmas time when our buildings are less occupied, when people are away on holiday, but also relevant for when we're in lockdown and our buildings are less used then as well. So all feedback and topic suggestions, particularly leading into next year, will be gratefully received. Um, thank you for your time and interest in attending. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>